So this morning, our first speaker, uh, we are honored to have Dr. Ricarda Steinbrecher. Uh, she is a biologist and molecular geneticist based in Oxford. She first specialized in gene regulation and gene modification, and she worked in the field of mutational analysis, gene identification, and gene therapy. Since 1995, her focus has been on biosafety aspects of genetically modified organisms and their potential impacts. More recently, her work fo focuses on synthetic biology, new genetic engineering techniques such as CRISPR-Cas9 and gene drive organisms. Um, she's been actively involved in UN-led international processes, especially the Convention on Biological Diversity and its products, and in particular the Cartagena Protocol. Um, Dr. Steinbrecher is a member of the Federation of German Scientists, who she represents at um, international uh, UN negotiations, and she is a founding member and board member of ENSA. Dr. Steinbrecher, please. Thank you for the kind introduction and welcome everyone. Uh, I have a problem with my voice, it keeps disappearing. So I have my rescue remedy here. The, the task to introduce um, the science and the biology of gene drives um, <clears throat> is, is, a, is a bit daunting because it's such a big field. I'm trying to keep it uh, sort of concise, but you, you have also the, the report, so this is just sort of a taster and, and you can later um, look at it more yourself. I don't know which screen to look at here. Oh, here's one as well. Uh, okay, there's three. Um, for what are gene drives? I just read this to you. Synthetic gene drives are a new form of genetic engineering that provide the tools for permanently modifying or potentially even eradicating species in the wild. That is the important part, species in the wild. Unlike the previous GMOs, most gene drive organisms, gene drive organisms as GDOs abbreviated here, are not meant to stay where they are released, but instead are designed and purpose-built to spread and to drive their modified genes <clears throat> far and wide. So that is a crucial difference to uh, genetically modified organisms as we know them. They were uh, using domesticated um, species, usually crops, and in an agricultural, well-maintained, well-structured uh, systems, while gene drive organisms are uh, the species that are not domesticated, that have a huge variety, are living in uh, an, uh, a natural environment, and therefore uh, we have quite a different situation here. So one cannot just go from, extrapolate from one to the other. Um, the aim of gene drives, uh, behind using gene drives, is to eliminate, to alter, or to replace wild populations or whole species. I'm making a difference here. Um, sometimes you will only see alter or replace as one, but there is two different types of gene drives. One is actually going out to modify everyone directly. Another form of gene drives is to release a certain modified form that then is trying to push out the other. So that is literally replacing it. So one should actually... Um, uh, sort of differentiate between these two. Um, <clears throat> the idea um, is, is not new, wanting to uh, use the genetics of an organism <clears throat> against itself, to get rid of it because it's unwanted, it's a pest, etc. Like Zebrowski, uh, already in the 1940s, um, <clears throat> was suggesting this, and in the 1950s and late, uh, up until the light, uh, late 50s, I'll start again. In the 1950s, the idea started of using the sterile insect <clears throat> techniques. And I need a glass of zipper water, sorry about that. So that was modifying sort of insects with radiation so that they would be infertile <clears throat> and then do a large scale release. 
<clears throat> and this program uh, ran into the late 70s and it was successful with one species, the, the screwworm fly in the US, which required huge amounts of, of releases and a lot of infrastructure and money. But actually the idea, the hope that it would really result in, <clears throat> in, in a usable kind of technology was um, come to an abrupt end because it was just too difficult and required too much releases. So what if one could make the traits that, that one wants to, to be able to spread on their own? Or the trait, for example, that being of infertility. If I could make that spread on its own, then I would not need to resort to these large scale releases and these problems they ran into. So uh, coming from there, <clears throat> just to recall the Mendelian inheritance, if I have a mutant gene, a mutant type like up here, um, if that gets sort of uh, crossed out in the wild, it just gets thinned out, diluted, and will vanish. But if I take this um, mutation and put it together with a gene drive, then you can see what happens. Every time it crosses with the wild type, all the um, offspring will actually be the modified version, as you can see. So at the end, it's saturated with a gene drive organism. Um, this sometimes is called super Mendelian inheritance, especially if it's coming the near 100%. But a gene drive is anything that is higher than 50% inheritance. This a bias towards its own um, sort of inheritance. The idea of gene drives itself also isn't really <clears throat> new. Already in 2003, um, <clears throat> Austin Bird published a paper um, talking about selfish genes, site-directed selfish genes, site-specific selfish genes that could be used in order to drive genes into a population. <clears throat> I'll come back to the term of uh, selfish genes in a moment um, because that's, it's, it's a broad category <clears throat> and the site-specific ones is a subcategory of that. He also mentions in this paper work that was, whoops, work that was done uh, with transposable elements, also selfish genes, but uh, selfish elements that were attempted to be used um, to, as, as gene drives, and I'll come back to that. But this work was very laborious, very hard, and it just did not take off because the tools were not there. So, as I said, the technical capabilities were not there, and now they are appearing in the next stage. Um, but I'll come to the CRISPR-Cas in a moment. In between, let's just uh, look at that. Gene drives as natural elements. <clears throat> we often have been told recently that, well, it's all coming from nature. I mean, all the different forms of gene drives that uh, the synthetic gene drives are based on um, have been around for a long time and have no problem there. So why should this be any different? So I would like to, to mention here that they are considerably altered. They are taken out of their context, taken out of the species they uh, are, have developed in, putting somewhere quite different and are also meant to serve a different task because you can imagine evolutionary processes, co-evolution, if something arises that gives a certain element an, an inheritance benefit, then uh, there will other, be other mechanisms that will keep that in check. So there is a co-evolution, uh, like with transposable elements, they can jump and multiply and, and uh, be transferred like in a higher number than the other genes, but then the organism actually finds a way to clamp them down, to just stop it from, from moving, to deactivate them. Nevertheless, we now, for example, know with transposable elements, which are widespread, most of them are blocked, that they have been playing a crucial role in speciation, in evolution, right? So what am I saying here? That a lot of these mechanisms that we find 
actually do have a role somewhere that we do not understand. They come from a system that has co-evolved with it, where it actually is helped, it kept in check. So if we use these mechanisms and elements and put them somewhere else, we have no idea what we are actually taking on board <clears throat> and what the evolutionary and co-evolutionary responses will be, or if we are <clears throat> triggering extra responses we are just not aware of. Anyway, um, that said, I'll go to the next slide. Gene drive organisms um, can be used for population scale genetic engineering, potential species eradication, and ecosystem engineering. What can be genetically modified or what can be an organism to have a gene drive? Currently worked on <clears throat> are plants or suggested are plants, insects, fish, livestock, nematodes, small mammals, fungi. Uh, you can fill in the dots. We hear quite often new suggestions and new uh, projects. Um, basically any organism that sexually reproduces and will do so with a frequency, a fast frequency. Like a tree is very difficult because that would take very long to, to get to reproduce. But organisms like mice, for example, um, or like insects who reproduce fast, they are very well suited for that type. Um, just as a recap, I mentioned the aim. I said something about the history and the biology behind Mendelian inheritance and the gene drives where they really come from and the problems we need to keep in mind. Before I jump now into the detail, <clears throat> I wanted to say it is important that in between, when we go into the details, <clears throat> we take a step back and look at the big picture. Because without that, <clears throat> we, we just get so hooked into the technology itself, which in a way uh, was also said in the introductory words, that we do not look at the risks and we get hooked into the into the benefits idea and in, yeah, the techniques. Now CRISPR-Cas9, as I mentioned, is the game changer. Um, 2014, Kevin as well, Kevin is somewhere around, I'm sure. Hi, Kevin. Um, <clears throat> um, did this important paper where he and his colleagues were stating it is <coughs> theoretically possible to use this to build a gene drive that works globally and that eradicates, that can eradicate all species. It was at that time still a theory. And just very, very recently, very, very shortly afterwards, this came out. It was submitted in December 2014. Um, the different groups saying like mutagenic chain reaction, a method uh, for converting, well, ordinary uh, Mendelian inheritance into super Mendelian inheritance in this case, fruit flies turning them from brown into yellow in a, in a, in a rapid way, not in a Mendelian way. And this was the proof of principle that it actually worked, what was said in Kevin Eswell's paper. Um, and Bia, one of the um, people involved in it said, I believe it's going to transform the world of genetics because it's going to allow researchers to bypass the rules of genetics in many different spheres of activities. So that's what this tool can do. And in fact, going from there, a lot of scientists have actually said, we need a public debate urgently. And we need to see what are we doing with this? Is this something we want to use? How are we going to use it? What are the risks? But it is a technology that is because CRISPR-Cas has been running away. This is running away almost on its own terms as well. Um, so we urgently need that. And our symposium is trying to address that as well. Let us just recap quickly. CRISPR-Cas is a genome editing tool. We all know it as that. Genome editing general principles is you have a piece of DNA and at a specific site, the nuclease, in this case the Cas, CRISPR-Cas, will just cause a DNA's double strand break. It will just uh, sever the, the strand. What happens then is that the cell's own repair mechanism will kick in because, of course, evolutionary, like DNA breaks 
take place uh, occasionally, and then the cell will need to respond, because otherwise it's fatal. So usually uh, there are now two different ways a, a cell can react when there is a double strand break. One is to just uh, stick the ends somehow back together again, which we call the non-homologous end joining. And in the meantime, often what will happen is um, that here where this strand has been breaking, the cell's own enzymes already started nibbling at it and have uh, slightly deteriorated it, so that this uh, form of, of um, repair actually will not be resulting in the original form of the DNA, but it is altered. Something is missing or sometimes something gets added in. It is used for gene disruption for knockout effects. It is known to be error-prone. Um, the other one is the uh, homology-directed repair, which actually needs a homology. It needs a similarity to recognize sort of um, the area where, where there might be the information in, in a double, because as you know, we all have each, each chromosome <clears throat> two times. So it might be looking around thinking, where is still an, an unbroken version of myself and can I repair it? And that mechanism one can use by adding a template to the cell. And uh, if one does that, one can, for example, make it a small alteration in a, in a specific sequence, or one can um, <clears throat> theoretically um, add whole DNA sequence, add whole genes, which, uh, for example, in plants is, is mighty difficult. Um, but it is the, the one on the right that we need to know about here. That is what we need for gene drives, <clears throat> that mechanism. And that is a bit the, the sort of problem uh, for gene drives because that is a way where the this, this cell sometimes will just kick, kick this repair mechanism in and will stick it together differently and therefore the gene, this gene here will not be inserted but the CRISPR-Cas also no longer can cut it because it's been altered, it cannot recognize it. This is a form to build resistance. I come back to that in a moment. But just so you know, these are the two important points. So here is, <clears throat> here's it sort of in a schematic form. We basically have CRISPR-Cas as a, as a gene construct. <clears throat> and it is um, uh, placed somewhere in, uh, in, in, in a section where, uh, that was designed for. And now you can see there is the two areas that look similar. So there is, that is the homology areas. So CRISPR-Cas itself will cut here, and then these will drift apart, as you can see. Yeah. But with the homology, the recognition side, um, it will actually trigger the homology repair mechanism, and therefore, will have itself copied across to the side where it just had cut, right? So therefore, basically in meiosis, in, 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 uh, in the sexual reproduction cycle, this will take place. Um, if it goes according to design, of course, which it doesn't always, because as I said before, um, the different repair mechanisms uh, actually will work at different times. Different organisms will have a, a leaning, for example, to the non-homologous end joining, like plants. Um, otherwise, also like in different cell cycles, in different species, in different development stages, one repair mechanism uh, might be stronger than the other. So, so, so therefore, it is not all that simple as it appears to be here. <clears throat> this process also is called homing. It basically finds the place it's supposed to go and inserts itself. That is called homing. Uh, so it's also a homing gene drive. The other version uh, is you can add then, if you want, a payload, a so-called payload gene in it, which is a gene that will have a certain trait that you would like actually to spread. So this version would be used in order to disrupt the gene you would like to uh, to disrupt, like one for fertility, for example. Whilst here, 
you would want to just uh, insert it somewhere where you can then make the payload gene travel. These are all, don't worry, this is um, in, the, in the book, in the report. But this is just the species that have um, concept of proof for the CRISPR-Cas gene drive technology. It's Drosophila, it's, uh, it's, it's yeast, it's three forms of mosquitoes, it's recently also mice. The, the, with mice in particular, um, the conversion rate is very low. So some of them are higher, like here in, in yeast, but uh, the, the important one is actually the column for resistance. That has been really sort of the, the, the worry. Um, because if you build, if you have resistance creeping up, then CRISPR-Cas can't cut. That means you have all of a sudden a part of the population where the gene drive can't move forward. So that population then of course will enhance and at the end you will not have your result in, in the suppression or eradication. And there is one way where uh, it has been circumvented, which is the, where is it? Here. It's the Kiro et al. 2018. They actually used <coughs> something which is called a conserved gene, a conserved gene sequence. Because if you have a gene that is crucial for survival, and it has been around for a long time and has been a highly preserved meaning, as soon as it's being altered, it will not function any longer. As soon as you have a mutation in it, it actually uh, will not produce the protein you want. Um, if you use such a gene, then if resistance occurs in that, actually the gene can't work and this, the organism eventually will just die. So that resistance can't spread, the, which is, um, which is one, one way to potentially make it uh, spread globally. But of course, the, the downside of that is that it very easily now can spread in, in uh, closely related species because very often they will have the same conserved gene sequence because it's an over, over evolution it has evolved. So like in the, in the um, Anopheles gambia complex, for example, um, it is found also in the related species. That said, let's move on. Limitations of CRISPR-Cas, just to uh, recall, unintended on-target effects, for example, are large, there are sort of papers um, and, and research has shown large deletions can be found, like up to 9.5 kilobytes, you know, um, around the cutting site or complex rearrangements. Uh, or when working with cell lines, um, they also found, um, uh, for example, that with frame shift mutations, I, I will not want to go into the details here, they found that um, that intended alteration actually had a side effect of um, giving rise to new proteins and RNAs that weren't there before, which then of course can have either regulatory or biological function alterations in that organism. But that is on target side effects. Of course there are always the off target side effects when CRISPR cuts, cuts somewhere else than intended, for example. Um, for gene drives itself, Problems are, as I said, resistance buildup, the inefficiency in plants, also inefficiency in mice. Um, there's issues with a tumor suppressor P53 that were found, for example, um, which will, uh, in, in a way, is, is the guardian of, of, of the, the, the integrity of the DNA, which will often lead rather to cell death than letting a mutation arise. Uh, which is, was found in, in, in mice in particular. There's off-target effects, invasiveness, and potential global reach of, of these gene drives, and irreversibility. Irreversibility is uh, particularly uh, crucial, um, and I'll come back to that later. 
just to mention, CRISPR-Cas is not only used as a homing gene drive, as I had just explained, but also in, in other forms of gene drives more and more, like in the X shredder, which basically is the X chromosome will be cut uh, in, during spermatogenesis, like in the, in the, in the male. It, it will be cut into a number of uh, pieces. Basically, you shred it, and then it can't be put together again. Therefore, there will be no um, sperm, for example, that contains still X chromosomes. So therefore, there will be no female offspring. Uh, or in the toxin antidote system, um, it is being used, I come to that in a moment, which is uh, where CRISPR just gets used as, as a toxin. This is an overview of um, the different forms. The selfish genetic elements, as I mentioned, they are, turned, uh, they are sometimes called selfish because they just uh, look after their own spread and can, can spread even if they cause... Uh, sort of um, a harm almost, like they don't need to be beneficial to spread. There we have now two forms. One is the over-replicator, which I just mentioned. Like CRISPR-Cas will basically copy itself across. So it will replicate in, in a higher instance than, than others. Transposable elements do the same. Uh, homing elements, originally called homing endonuclease genes, but one can also use other um, site-specific endonucleases for it. The other one, the other category, is the transmission distorters, where basically the mechanism works in a way that it favors one instead of the other. Um, most of them will take place during um, amniotic drives. Um, not all of them. I mean, Medea is sort of like, should actually be sort of half in, half out. Um, but here you can see you have some that will disrupt the sex ratio, so the sex ratio distorters. And then you have the toxin antidote systems that uses toxins in order to um, prefer one variety over the other. I'll explain that in the moment. And a big area is also the, the underdominance. It's too much to go into here now, but uh, you will have a nice read in the report if you want. Um, five minutes? Okay, thank you. Toxin antidote system. Uh, just to explain it briefly, uh, in this case, uh, this is sort of like uh, Davis et al. had uh, suggested that in 2001 to be used in a certain way. Here, you have like a lethal gene, a toxin gene. That is the regulator for it, the promoter, right? So if you have a suppressor that would act on the promoter, then the toxin gene will not be active and there is no toxin. And if you do the equivalent for another toxin, you will actually, you can build a system, like have that on one chromosome and that on another chromosome. That means if this chromosome on its own, if that co complex on its own construct is there, the organism will die because that toxin will be produced and vice versa. If just that one is there, it will die. But if the other one is present, then this one will suppress the toxin of this one, and that suppressor will suppress this one. So you can see one can build systems in that way. You can put them, the, the, you can have the toxin antidote, uh, the antidote in this case, the repressor, you can have it like time staggered, so that for example, like uh, in, in the egg cells, um, the toxin will be built, and the antidote would work in, uh, in embryogenesis, because that's when the toxin would become active. So all that half then the antidote would survive, the others wouldn't. Um, there is a case where a similar system like this was tested also with proof of concept by Akbari, where they used that uh, ma maternal um, effect, the, the lethal effect. Now, this system can, is very versatile and can be used in, in different forms. Um, but you can see that is not a self-spreading one originally, but if you put this, a, a large group of, of, of individuals that have both into a population, when they outcross, they will not be able to provide a, a sort of the remedy, so those offspring will die. But if they cross with each other, they will survive. So therefore, they can build a solid population. And if they are the majority, 
then they will push the others out. And uh, you can, with this, also add other desirable genes to it. Of course, they can be delinked. Uh, there's always sort of things that will not work. You know, it can be silenced by the cell mechanisms. Um, they, they can be split up. And then you have uh, a non-functioning system, of course. In any case, these new organisms would be genetically modified. Um, next one. Gene drive categories, one could, could look at them, those who need a high threshold, as I just, for example, said. These ones, you, when you use them, you need plenty of them, so the, the threshold is quite high. In, in the case of Akbari, it was 25%. Some need much more, some need less. Then there's threshold-independent gene drives like the CRISPR-Cas, um, or some temporary self-limiting drives are being suggested. The suppression drive means it's used in order to eradicate modification. I mentioned it before, or replacement drives um, are to alter the, the population. Now, one thing is important, removability or reversibility. Um, it's, it's, it's a big problem. Can, can, can they be removed if something goes wrong, right? If we say like the gene which was inserted actually is having is a real problem. To remove them would mean that you could take them out and the rest of the population would be ordinary. Um, uh, the reversibility often is more used to, to say one can reverse the impact, but the result will still be genetically modified. For example, by I'll come to another slide later, um, by so-called gene drive catchers, anti-gene drives, there will be other gene drives be sent after the first one to trying to undo or to undo its um, abilities and to basically then you have two CRISPR-Cas uh, out in the, in the wild population and one is trying to sort of destroy the other uh, and or there's immunization, immunization drives which actually go out there in order to already put the, um, um, what did I say it's called? Oh God, my, my memory. Um, the resistance uh, sequences there. We, we should remember they are all then genetically modified. And the important thing is, even with resistance, that CRISPR is an active compound. It's an active gene, right? Um, even if there's resistance, it will still be active. It's in the organism. And with that, it will... Uh, occasionally cut at different places. It's basically, I'm saying it has a much higher, much higher um, mutational background and therefore we need to be really alerted to that because we are putting a system in there that is uh, coming from a complete different background and it will have evolutionary consequences. Here, just to, to say, uh, the real problems and search for safety is going on, but basically a lot of them have not even got any kind of proof of concept. Um, those those uh, gene drives, for example, sent as anti-gene drives are highly theoretical without proof of concept. And the other versions, of course, have been shown to be much too complex to actually work in biological systems. Uh, last slide. Um, what we really need to look into, and I think Doug will come into that in a moment, like the risks and the assessment hurdles. Because how do we assess something? Firstly, where the system itself is so unpredictable, but then for it to be released into yet another system with high complexity that we cannot predict. How do we do a risk assessment there? Evolutionary aspects, structures and functions of genomes, response systems, we know much too little about it. How do we do the assessment? Complexities are high. There's real, real hurdles um, also, meaning a lot of the so-called benefits and dreams just do not look as if they can be actually produced. So even if you go to, to the, uh, the, the hopes there, it's, it's, it's not very likely. That doesn't mean they cannot really s produce serious harm, though, if they're released, because one thing we have to understand, we have, are we, with this, we are putting the laboratory into the wild. We are no longer uh, in control of it in the laboratory setting or in contained environments. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.